I want to talk a little bit today about forgiving ourselves and loving ourselves. And I want to talk about why it's biblical and why we should do it. Because it took me a really long time to get to the point where I understood why it's biblical to love ourselves. Or to be more specific, why, why it's important to love myself. It took me even longer to understand why it's biblical to forgive ourselves or myself. Um, I'm certain I'm not the only one who studied the Bible thoroughly for years and struggled with this idea. So originally, I think you know it was it was partly rooted in a false image of what God was really like, that He's really a loving and accepting Father, and partly because I needed to be free from a spirit of condemnation, which at the time. I misunderstood to be God's correction or his conviction when it was really just um, the accuser. But it also probably was a reaction to pop culture psychology that was pushing the idea of loving yourself and, and forgiving yourself. And amidst that pop psychology, they disespoused anything to do with Jesus with its pseudo healing and pseudo self help philosophy, and that's not to say anything about pseudo prophecy and pseudo spiritual knowledge, but even still, like I, I was free from, I got free from the other misconceptions, and I was experiencing the Father Heart of God truly, but I still couldn't wrap my mind around this idea of loving myself. I knew God's unending, unconditional love. I knew his complete forgiveness. I understood his value for me and his identity over me. I, it just didn't seem right to love myself and especially to forgive myself. And some of my hesitancy was because of the, the mantras that so many schools and, te and churches and society preach that really sound good but aren't quite right, at least the way they're often applied and the intent behind them. And the way that they're delivered to the masses, they're things like, well, life isn't about you, or the church doesn't exist for you, or live to serve others, put others before yourselves, uh, don't be narcissistic or selfish. Well, you know, all of these ideas, you know, um, aren't bad in themselves. In fact, they're, they're rooted in biblical concepts. I could give you a verse or a proof text for each one, but but there's a proper expression of these that's only found when Christ is served and when he's given first place and he works his love and power through us to live these out in the way that he intended, not through some self-imposed rules or introspection of our own understanding where, where often our hearts end up condemning us needlessly and we live without, without power. So these phrases have this nice way of sounding spiritual, but the problem with the mantras is that when they're misapplied, they perpetuate the enemy's lies of insignificance, of false condemnation, of self-hatred, and purposelessness. And this actually feeds the very attitude that Jesus came to eradicate. Much, too much of the world, including the church, believes this because they live under a religious spirit that poses as God, making them feel horrible all the time, and never really receiving the Father's love, his forgiveness and acceptance of them. So I, I understand that the church is trying to respond to a cultural attitude which is self-absorbed, self-idolizing, and dishonoring of God and his word. But the proper response to this doesn't involve agreeing with the lie that says, well, we're nothing and only God is anything. And this is super spiritual and religious, because if that were so, then God would have never have made mankind or people. He would never have sent his son Jesus. He would have existed by himself and only for himself. But you see, love and grace are giving. They impart a worth that's undeserved, a worth that doesn't disappear the moment we receive it so we can become slaves all over again. It might seem counterintuitive to present to a selfish person their worth and significance, but I would suggest that the reason that people are selfish is because they don't understand how much God truly loves them. 
Now it's ingrained in sin and the sin nature, but but God's love f frees them from that. It frees them from that orphaned heart. See, they're orphaned in their heart, and they're desperately grasping for anything in life out of fear and terror that what they value will be taken away at any moment, not knowing that what the Father has for them is unending in generosity and grace. Of course, there's the bigger picture that God has in mind. And all the stories in the Bible, um, they typify Christ. And our lives do as well. They're, they're a picture of God's uh, grace being worked out in our lives. Or as it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, that we're a living epistle. And of course, all glory, all honor and power will ultimately go to Jesus. But the balanced response is to communicate his perfect love and acceptance to the world and even to the church, for that matter, the identity and significance which Jesus has paid for by his own blood to be sons of the living God. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. I, I don't think an artist would think he was really being honored if you said, if you took a look at his painting or his sculpture and you said, Man, that's really that's really not anything is it it it's it's really nothing hey but you're great you're great i i don't i don't i don't want to say anything bad about you but your work i mean it's it's really nothing i don't think that that artist would really feel that you're honoring him and his ability so emphasizing the significance and value that the father places on each of us as his children and on his creation it doesn't diminish the glory that belongs to Jesus. In fact, it amplifies it. When we look at his creative work and his design and we say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And we say, you know, of your works, they're amazing. And you know it well. And then that amplifies the glory of the one who made it. And so all this I, I knew already. Okay, so we'll come back to this forgiving and ourselves and loving ourselves idea. I, I knew all this stuff, the value and the Father's love, but I still had a hard time with these other concepts because I couldn't find the verses that said you should love yourself or make sure you forgive yourself. And in fact, Jesus said many things that seemed to indicate otherwise. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And then in the epistles, he says, in the last days, people will be lovers of the, their own selves. And he wasn't at all indicating that that's a good thing. So all these, by the way, that these scriptures that I mentioned, I believe these ideas have to be interpreted in light of God's goodness and his unending love and not some kind of heartless devotion to a misplaced ideal at the expense of relationship. I, I think that if people are misapplying that, they could really do some damage you know, in their family and relationships if they're not understanding, understanding God's heart in it. Um, so there is, of course, a self-love and a selfishness that's of the world and of sin nature and not from Jesus. It's the kind of self-preservation that seeks only comfort and doesn't like correction and especially despises anything painful. It's that same bi diabolical attitude that Peter had when he was trying to protect Jesus from going to the cross and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So the modern twist is that it protects itself by calling everything else religious even if it's god if it doesn't like it or makes it uncomfortable it says oh that's just religious and so christians beware and there are people that try to forgive themselves or to forgive others without any power that comes from the blood of jesus or the holy spirit they they experience no genuine difference in themselves or relationships because of this every religion has some kind of forgiveness aspect of it but without Jesus, it doesn't do anything because it doesn't have the authority to forgive without him because he's the judge that alone can release from guilt. And Jesus' blood is the atonement for sin. He says without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions of sin. There's no cleansing from sin. 
There's no cleansing um, from what we need forgiveness for. So without Jesus, there's no true forgiveness, and not even between people. I kept praying about the two ideas, though, you know, because I'd heard so many respected Christian leaders talk about loving yourself and forgiving yourself, and I couldn't find the scriptures to back up what they were saying, so I just kind of left it on the shelf. I couldn't just take their word for it just because they're big, popular, or influential. I needed God to show me a way I could understand if it was truly of him. So uh, sometimes I get revelations in the shower, and I think this time I was in the shower, and, and then I had this revelation of a few verses that helped me to understand loving ourselves from his perspective. And one was Jesus' words. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it seems simple. Most people have heard of the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. But I think there's more to it than our first impressions and how most people apply it, especially people who aren't uh, Christians. It's implied in these verses that we must have love for ourselves. We must love ourselves if we are to properly love others. And some would say, oh, well, we already love ourselves. People already love themselves, so that's not a problem. In fact, people probably love themselves too much. Um, but I would disagree because loving ourselves as Jesus loves us is different than how the sin nature wants to be loved because the sin nature is often rooted in lust and covetousness and in pride. But Jesus loves us perfectly, seeing us for who he originally created us to be, and loves us into that place. He accepts us where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. He wants us to be just like Jesus. His love isn't tainted by any kind of lies or self-deception or like glossing over or justifying or hiding sin. He also doesn't overcorrect through a hypersensitive conscience or what the Bible calls a weak conscience that never really feels good enough and is constantly finding things that are wrong or believing some things are sinful, but they're not really sinful. He's perfect in his perspective and lovingly corrects in ways that release condemnation and guilt and bring in life and freedom. Often, though, people are still bound in sin and guilt and condemnation and self-hatred. And God has to sovereignly break through all of these before we can even grasp what loving ourselves look like. And when we grasp the immeasurable love he has for us, and by the way, this is a never-ending process, not something we master when we first learn how to sing, Jesus, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's an ongoing process. So when we grasp that immeasurable love, then we see the precious thoughts he has for us. That he says are as many as the sand on the seashore in Psalm 139. We see the plans he has for us to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a future and a hope. Uh, it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. When we love ourselves by allowing ourselves to be loved in these ways, we begin to love others, especially God, in the same way, the, the word says we love him because he first loved us. We forgive others, realizing how much we have been forgiven. And this is what he meant by love your neighbor as yourself. To love anyone only to the degree we love ourselves would be incomplete and diminishing. But if we truly allowed ourselves to experience the fullness of the love of God toward us, our capacity to love others would be just like his love. It would be unending and another verse that he showed me was from Ephesians. It says, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. In these verses, it illustrates a good kind of self-love, one that nourishes and cares for itself, and then by extension cares for those connected to him, his wife, his family, the way and the degree to which a man loves himself will precipitate into how he loves his wife and his children. It means that loving the new person in Christ, who he originally imagined us to be. This needs to be nourished. It needs to be cultivated. It needs to be protected. It needs to be provided for, exercised into the fullness of divine health. A healthy soul feeds itself good spiritual food, just as it, the body. 
It loves itself in this way, washing it with the water of the word. Okay, so we should love ourselves. Got it. Check. What about forgiving ourselves? It took me a lot longer to get to the same point on this concept. It was always taught to me that Jesus is the one who forgives sins ultimately, and that our forgiveness is really an extension of what he did for us. If we offend others and ask their forgiveness and they forgive us or should, and we forgive them if they apologize and ask for forgiveness, or we ask for God's grace to forgive people when they don't apologize or even see a need to seek reconciliation or don't really want to change and keep offending in the same ways over and over, or think we, we need to apologize when they're the ones hurting us and others around them, but even still we forgive or we're supposed to. But ourselves, I, I didn't get it. Jesus already forgave me, I'm forgiven. Even when others don't, he still forgives me. He's the one who condemns and justifies, so there's no longer any condemnation. Case closed, right? Well, he showed me this other verse. In 1 Corinthians six eighteen. he says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sin a person all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He goes on to say that we as Christians are not our own, and that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, there's a part of us that doesn't belong to us, and when we sin in this way, we are trespassing on God's property and violating something that no longer belongs to us. If we sin against it, then we need to be forgiven by it. Now, it seems strange to consciously be distinguishing the various parts of our being, our soul, our body, our spirit, our will, but it's biblical. David talked to his soul. He, he, he talked to his soul, or in Greek, it's the psyche. Uh, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Our, our will can violate the body that belongs to God. Our will is an incredibly powerful tool, and I think in these last days, it's the understanding of that is becoming even more critical. But our will is incredibly powerful. It's potent enough to eternally damn us when it's divorced from God's will. Now, he has forgiven us when we confess our sins and trust Jesus to release us. However, our body may still be suffering under the damage of sin against it in the same way that a friend may still feel hurt by something we said or did. Even if Jesus has forgiven us, they might still feel hurt. So here's another scripture. In 1 John 3, 20, it says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Well, how is it possible that one part of our body, our heart, can condemn, that means to stand in judgment over where there is no forgiveness, how can our heart condemn our whole self? Well, a heart that's not submitted to the Holy Spirit's leading and loving correction may actually usurp God's authority, take control, and try to drive itself, creating, creating a weak conscience or a hypersensitive conscience. And then, in turn, every violation of that hypersensitive conscience, it heaps unnecessary condemnation upon the whole person or unnecessary guilt or false guilt. So, this creates a need for forgiveness. If we can sin against ourselves, we need to forgive ourselves and to receive forgiveness from ourselves consciously. So it is biblical also to forgive ourselves. So self-unforgiveness, like a bitter cancer, could be growing inside of an otherwise healthy body, stealing the energy the body needs to thrive with holding care and nourishment and favor where there needs to be some, because that's what unforgiveness does. It withholds care and nourishment and favor where it needs to be. He mentions how some of the early church in Corinth were misusing the communion or Eucharist elements. They were becoming drunk and abusing their bodies rather than nourishing themselves and others around them with self-control and moderation. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. 
That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have died. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under some such judgment. So when we love ourselves the way he loves us and sees us, it becomes a well of life and a healing for ourselves and those around us. When we forgive ourselves, it frees us from unnecessary self-condemnation and self-hurt or worse sometimes self-hatred. It frees us from that and it liberates us to nourish ourselves with his good and perfect gifts. It increases our capacity to forgive others and to love God back and to love people around us. So I encourage you to spend some time meditating on these scriptures that, that I shared with you and uh, leave your comments and ideas below and let me know what God's doing with you and how you're getting healing in, in some of these ways. I know it's done a lot for me to learn how to love myself uh, as God wants wants me to and to forgive myself as God wants me to. So appreciate you turn, tuning in and uh, we'll talk to you later.